Thank you. Do you all hear me loud and clear? Because I want to start by saying something controversial or not to everybody's liking. The photographs that I'm going to show you come out of a series that I've done, which really is an examination of our ethos in this country. Um, it's, a, a, it's an ongoing project that I started in about, well, many, many years ago, but in 1983, quite self-consciously, and which I've been continuing in recent times. I heard today that a painting that was going to be shown on this art fair was withdrawn on the grounds that it might offend the sponsors of this event. And I want to say here loud and clear that I think this is a terrible interference with the freedom of expression and of speech, and that if we haven't got the balls to stand up to these things, we shouldn't even be talking. I was told that it might offend the government. And in the arts, if these are about the arts, these exhibitions, our very function, in my opinion, is to be iconoclastic. We should respect absolutely nothing. We should not be, be afraid of challenging anything. And if we do it badly, well, that's bad. But we should try to do it well. And in my opinion, this is a very sad day here in Johannesburg. The pictures that I'm going to talk about date, are, there are two groups, and I'm going to talk very loosely about them. They don't form a cohesive whole. Um, the, the first group is a series of photographs that I did between the, I think, the 1960s, the earliest, or the 1970s, and um, the 1990s. Uh, they're photographs that I haven't really published. One or two of them might have been seen, but I've not published or exhibited them before. And I've called the, the whole series the frock and other photographs and other pictures. And the frock refers to the frock that you see drying in the sun here. This was a photograph made at the confluence of the Orange and the Faal rivers in the Northern Cape um, in 1988. And it was, to me, a, maybe a very moving thing to see, uh, that out of this obviously very poor farm laborers' home, or homes, out of these homes, was this frock, probably the pride of a woman or a girl in this home. The next is the glorious dead. Um, a photograph made in uh, Adelaide in the, in, I think Adelaide is in the Eastern Cape. Um, and I was struck, first of all, by the uh, congruence of the soldier with his st standing to attention with his, with his rifle and the woman at the side of the picture with her broom. There seemed to me to be a nice congruence here. It also relates to the mode of expression about the people who died in our various wars, the glorious dead. I think a lot is to be read into those words. They were glorious in dying for us, if you like, but perhaps there's something more to be said about them dying, and that wasn't so glorious, I'm not sure. The next photograph, I did it in Singer in uh, in Zululand, in KwaZulu, in Natal. And um, I was very struck by the, uh, the, round, the roundness, if you like, of almost everything in that photograph, except in the right foreground, there is um, a sketch of a very angular modern structure, possibly by a child. I hope you can see it. Um, there's a boulder in the right-hand bottom corner of the picture. I don't know if you can see it, but there is a chalked outline of a, of a modern structure. And for me, this indicated the, if you like, the wish of a, of a young person living in this traditional homestead to move out of it, to move away. The next photograph 
is at Broadway's in the Tenth Sky in 1975. And this is a photograph that you would not be able to do today, as far as I can see, because people have either progressed or regressed, I'm not sure what the word is, to um, dwellings that are still, in a sense, formally round, but are in fact hexagonal or octagonal. They're angled, and the roofs are no longer thatched. They are now made of corrugated iron and at angles to each other. So this, to the people who live there, represents progress. Whether it is progress is another, ma is another matter, and this is what values are about. People value the things that they value, and really we can't dispute them. Um, these very beautiful huts are no longer to be seen. The next photograph is one in the Huntam, in the, in the Karoo, uh, near a place that has now become very popular for an annual event, a big fire. Um, what's it called again? Um, Tanquin, Tanqua, Tanqua Karoo, I think it's called. Um, this is a very difficult kind of photograph to make. Um, our landscape, except early in the morning and late in the afternoon when the shadows become much stronger, is uh, it, it, it's very difficult to, to pin down because as you look at it, it recedes. It goes further and further away from you. Uh, so this was an attempt to, to hold that landscape. Um, it's one that I like. I've never shown it. And in the bottom, in the, in the middle right-hand corner, there is a sheep crawl. Um, for me, it's always or nearly always imperative that I include in a photograph like this some evidence of our presence. Uh, I'm not terribly interested in nature per se. I'm interested in the land as our place of dwelling. The next photograph... I did this near Villiers. Um, I'm not sure whether this was done in the Free State or, um, the, or Natal, Quasilla Natal. Uh, it's very near Villiers, which lies, I think, in the... Uh, no, wait a minute. Free, it, it's in the Free State, sorry and it consists of cosmos, the flowers in the foreground, and um, uh, sunflowers in the middle ground, and beyond that the N1, oh, the N3, sorry. And it's, um, again, a photograph of landscape, uh, one that I've liked but never had the opportunity of showing. And then come three photographs that come from East London. This is a memorial to the German immigrants, and I love the way that the, the outlook of the, of the uh, sculpture is complemented by the, the lampposts all leaning back into the picture as though to reinforce the stance of the sculpture. Um, I tried to persuade my family that we should buy a house on the hill there, on the ridge, but they were outraged and I've never gone further with it. In the next photograph, Angle Court, uh, somehow the place exemplifies the name of the building and the name of the street. It's all about angles. And again, I loved the space. And in the next photograph, a man mowing the bowling green lawns, um, as though going on into the sea, Again, there is this lovely sense of space that East London seems to have in abundance. And then that was taken further, if you like, in another place, in Quasilla Natal. This is a granary um, belonging to a family near Ngotu. Um, a very elegant and gracious and graceful structure and I love the, again, the sense of space around it. Um, however, I, there is a flaw in the, in the taking of the photograph. I don't know if you've spotted it, but um, there's something in the background that intersects with the ladder, and that's probably why I did, I've never shown the photograph before. To me, that was a, 
a fundamental flaw in my seeing. The first one is that a taxi rank in Dornfontein in Johannesburg, not far from here, and aside from the fact that it's a very beautiful sculpture, these, these cows are beautifully sculpted, what is to me quite extraordinary is that in this city, which is renowned for its violence and its lack of respect for anything historic and of historic value, these cows are apparently treasured. There is no vandalization in, these, in, in this set of sculptures. There are four cows in this part of the picture. There's another one, or there are another two, I think, on the other side of the taxi rank. Taxi ranks are not, are not gentle places, and yet these sculptures have not been touched. You might see a man sitting on, on the rump of one of the cows. You might see somebody drying his overalls on the horns. But the cows themselves are sacred. And this, I think, is quite remarkable in a city like this. Um, in Port Elizabeth very recently, I was photographing a, a memorial to comrades who had been hanged or who had died in the struggle. And I was doing this in New Brighton, which is a township that was almost infamous for its um, uh, confrontational violence in the 1980s with the government. Um, at one stage, the whole township was surrounded by razor wire, and the army and the police were everywhere. So this was a place of great uh, political activity. The ANC had a major base there, if, if I can put it that way. And yet this memorial to the comrades had been violated. It was, uh, the, the, the lights had been smashed and the, um, uh, the place was in ruins. Then we get an elephant made by a local resident in Soweto and simply placed outside his house. Uh, I think a lovely gesture of public art. And the next one is something that is very moving about what's happening in Johannesburg. People are just doing things. This is a bed in Troival. It's called the Troival Bedtime Story. And it was done by a man called Johannes Dreyer and a lady called Leslie, P uh, Leslie Perkis and their friends. And it's a beautifully rendered piece of sculpture and it stands right next to a major highway, a major road. The next one is between Kimberley and Bloemfontein. And if you're worried about where to put your beloved's ashes after he dies and is cremated, there are 46,000 holes here awaiting the storage of ashes. It's a private initiative. I think it has a great deal to do with our, our obsession with security. Um, this place is privately owned. It, it offers 24-hour guarded security. And I'm told that the local cemeteries, which are municipal, have been desecrated. The next two come from the campus of the University of the Free State. You will probably remember, those of you who live here, that uh, a couple of years ago there was a terrible incident in which some young Afrikaner men from one of the residences, residences urinated into the food of some black workers. The university took this up very strongly, and there was discipline, of course, and the men were, uh, I think, expelled from the university. But the university then took a very courageous step. It invested in major works of art, so that this campus today is quite extraordinarily, um, is quite extraordinary in, the, in its beauty. You walk around the campus, and there are these magnificent pieces of art. And this is one of them. It's by a man called Angus Taylor, and it's called Van Heer tot Daar. And the next one, by Norea Mabasa, um, is made in, is carved in wild fig, and it's called Unity is Power, Let Us Be United. It's a very painful carving. It's full of pain and some joy. I think it emerges directly from the events that, we've t that I've told you about. And then we go to Cape Town, 
where there was, between 1841, I think, and 1921, um, in the Government Gazette of the Cape, every week they would publish a little notice that a child, Johannes, Anne, Nkomo, whatever, had been found in the streets destitute. And unless this child was claimed by somebody responsible, within six weeks, the child would be indentured. In other words, that child would then become an indentured worker in somebody's household or farm. That went on until very recently. Then we get a sculpture outside the Johannesburg Central Police Station. This used to be known as John Forster Square, and it is de dedicated to the memory of people who died in detention in this building. The 10th floor was the one that you, was used by the security police, and quite a number of people met their end there. The next one is just outside this building. It stands on the corner of Maud and Fifth Street in Santon, and it's quite an extraordinary piece of work, but not only in its rendering, which is, in my opinion, supremely banal, if you like, but it's quite extraordinary in the dedication that is evinced by the people who made it. The man who did it, essentially, the man who was the spirit behind it, is a businessman. And I'm told that he lost his son in a hijacking. So this, this rather brutal sculpture with its extraordinary banal um, sayings comes out of ourselves, really, where we are. And then we get a piece of work known as the Firewalker. And in the distance you see the city, and in the right-hand side you see the Firewalker, a, a sculpture by William Kentridge and Gerard Marx, who's done a beautiful piece of mosaic here. And in the foreground, you get this total chaos of broken paving stones. And when I asked about it, I was told that this is the result of copper cable theft. Uh, the thieves simply cut the cable at the base of a lamppost and then attach a rope to it and then attach the other end of the rope to the back of a bucky and pull the cable out. Quite brutal and very effective. And finally, a little sculpture or a memorial in a town called Stainsburg in the Eastern Cape, which I found to be very moving. Uh, it's on a little square of ground it's dotted with blue daisies that were planted by somebody there. There are paths leading to the memorial, which are outlined in beer bottles. And the memorial itself is to the comrades in the district who died in the struggle. Thank you very much. Thank you, thank you, David. That was uh, beautiful informative and also inviting. As I said, my task is to facilitate the question, but I'm going to be selfish because I'm controlling the mic. Before I open question, while you are thinking what to ask, I'm going to ask David just three questions or basically comment you should respond to. One is, I would like David to speak about why you've decided to work with black and white photography, as opposed to color photography, that's one. Two, okay. Very briefly, very briefly and essentially, I'm working, I'm doing this work in black and white because I'm angry. I'm angry at what is happening in this country and color is too sweet a medium in which to express that. It's how I worked during the years of apartheid when I photographed those early memorials and monuments and it's how I'm working now. My, my second question is, uh, I've, I've noticed that uh, most or some of the f uh, photographs or the site you've opted to photograph are photographs of artworks, whether the sculptures in PE or the work uh, in Blomfontein where the scene of uh, uh, the racist acts you talked about and other spaces, Harad Mark uh, as well as Kendrich. Why is there... Is, is that 
a conscious decision to photograph this artistic site or is something that it just happened when you are traveling around? Again, as briefly as I can do it, I photographed these because generally speaking, when we express ourselves, we do it in many, many f ways. It, if you look around you at the clothing of the people sitting next to you, near you, each of those people, each of those of those of, of, of our nearby nearby neighbours has expressed him or herself in the clothing that they're wearing at this moment, in the way that they're sitting, in in being here. These are all expressions of value. When we choose to make a public declaration, then we are in some way bringing together, consolidating a whole lot of values, a whole bundle of values that relate to the things that we have expressed. And these, these quite humble things mostly, in some cases more, more uh, uh, grandiose perhaps or ambitious, but each of them is an expression of values. And this is what I'm interested in. And how we express ourselves and, and the way we, and what we express is to me crucial. And it's where we are today. Crucially, we have to decide the kind of things that we're interested in expressing. My last question, and I'll open it to the floor, is uh, also I've noticed that most of your photographs are, are rather landscape, urbanscape, or cityscape, whatever you want to call it. You seem not to be interested in portraits. I've seen a range of a way of portraits, but what you've, what you've shown today, it seems to be there's no portraiture, or there's not, there are no portraits. Is there deliberate setup? Thank you. Again, this is very deliberate. Of course these are portraits. They're portraits of us. You don't have to have a person in the picture to make a portrait. Um, if, if we were to do an aerial photograph of this art fair today, of what it looks like, that would be a portrait of Johannesburg and South Africa in many ways. It is a summation of a whole lot of bundles of, of values. And by singling out something like that little memorial there, I have tried, really, to um, pay tribute to how that community chose to honor its fallen, the people who died there. Thank you, David. It's open to you good people to ask questions to David. I just wanted to comment or ask a question. Your first um, body of works that you showed today were quite spatial. Um, is it, how do you manage to capture that 3D space onto, into a 2D um, photograph? Well, if I knew the secret, I'd be able to tell you, but I don't. <laughs> it's bloody hard. I don't know how. You know, you, you have to sickle. Um, particularly with our, the, the interior plateau of South Africa, the, the Karoo, the felt, the high felt, even the bush felt, they go away from you as you look at them, so it's very difficult to photograph. Every now and again, something clicks and it comes together and works. But I, I don't know if there's a formula. I haven't got it anywhere. Thank you. Um, why are they no... <laughs> Sorry. Okay. Why are there no colors on your pictures? No colors. <laughs> Okay. Well, I tried to explain that uh, for, for 12 years, from about, 90, from about 2000 until 2012, I worked almost entirely in color. Uh, I'm working now in black and white because for what I want to express, I feel that black and white is the right medium. It gives you a certain sense of abstraction and of distance. Um, it's, not as, it's not as real as color. Uh, and for this reason, in my opinion, it's better suited to expressing what I want to say. Whether it is, is it, you, you know, you can, you can decide for yourself. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, hello, David. I just want to know, uh, you shoot, do you shoot black and white film or do you shoot digitally and then process black and white? Um, I have these are all photographed on film, uh, four by five sheet film. 
it's the camera that I prefer to use for almost everything, uh, a view camera with a black cloth, very ancient thing. Um, it's a very flexible instrument. Even, even for a rugby match, you might choose to do it, but it's rather difficult. But certainly for the sort of things that I photograph, it's, it's excellent. I do use digital ca uh, cameras when, when it's suitable, but I set the camera to black and white. For me, there is, no, there is no buggering around. If I'm going to shoot color, I shoot color. Otherwise, I shoot black and white. I don't change. Thank you. <laughs> yeah. That's the last comment because you are running out of time because there are also other speakers. Thank you. Hi. Um, I was just wondering, these spaces and objects you find, do you encounter them or do you locate them beforehand and then travel to a destination? Uh, for this particular project that I'm doing now, I have actually commissioned two people, one in Cape Town, one in Johannesburg, to research them for me, to find things, because many of them are hidden away. They're in fields, in, in little villages, they're in small towns, and even in big towns where they're not always easily seen. So I'm, I'm uh, given a lo long list of places. I have to make a kind of pre-selection from those, and then I travel to them, and then decide whether or not I'm going to photograph them. Thank you. Thank you, David. Um, just to conclude, I would like David to comp comp uh, uh, comment on one thing or two as a wrapping up. I've noticed um, your photograph travel between or traverse between the political and aesthetics. Can you make a comment that as just a concluding statement? As, do you conceive your photograph in terms of aesthetics or in terms of politics and how these two are play or play each other? And that will be a last comment. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks very much. Um, I, I'm highly politicized, as you might have concluded, and most of my work is highly politicized. However, I try to keep as open a mind as possible, and it delights me that in the new South Africa, as against the old one, there are many things now to be seen on our streets which are not political in any major sense. They're just people doing things that they like to do. Uh, that bed that I showed you in Troival, uh, there is a photograph in the, in the booth in which you'll find my work of a bus stop uh, by Leslie Perkis again and her, and her sister in which the, the, the letters have been engraved, love sits way above the bottom line. It's not a great statement. It's not earth shattering. But I found it very moving and very nice. So I, I'm not, I don't close my mind to anything. I try not to. I try to be open to everything. Um, uh, whether the aesthetic and the political or how they meet each other, I don't know because I'm not really very interested in aesthetics. I'm not in, uh, as, as a photographer, I know nothing about art. And aesthetics don't interest me. I'm interested in making a photograph that says what I want. It needs to com communicate at least to me, and I hope sometimes to somebody else. Thank you. Thank you, David, for your diplomatic response. Of course. <laughs> the beauty of being matured and being so diverse and being so experienced, you calculate your responses. Of course, David is political and is conscious about aesthetics. But again, I want to thank you for being a beautiful audience. And also, I want to thank you, David, for the honor of moderating this panel. Thank you. And again, there's another panel discussion coming. Roger Ballan, another greatest photographer. Please, we'll have just five minutes break just to refresh. Please join us while we are setting up. Thank you.